There's no way home, and I have no mercy There's no way up, so I'm going down Still I keep on living so you pull me closer When I have no mercy Let's carry on, no reasons to stop it I wouldn't do it on my own, I can't deny it Still trying to build and trying to be This is how I met my soulmate without ever actually speaking to him. I work at a small family-owned ice cream shop. This really cute guy would come in every Friday around 5. I never actually took his order as I was the one making the cones and sundaes behind the counter. He would always tell my coworker taking the orders, I want whatever she's in the mood to make. Tell her to surprise me. And he would point me out. My coworker would deliver the message and he would look at me and smile. Each Friday when he came in, he would say, I'll have my regular order, whatever she wants to make. I made him something different every week. I try to be creative and give him something new and fun every time. I would try really hard not to look over at his booth, but I would always catch myself staring. He started leaving me little flirty messages on his receipt with a small cash tip at his table. I started to write back on his orders with caramel or chocolate sauce on his plate the best I could. However, it wasn't very legible or practical, so I started giving him flirty little sticky notes with his order. It made my Fridays really fun and something to look forward to. I was waiting for him to ask me for my number or to ask me out on a date so we could actually talk to each other. This went on for weeks until he finally made the cutest move ever. Part 2, How I Met My Soulmate Without Ever Actually Speaking To Him After a few weeks of writing to each other on receipts, he finally decided to shoot his shot. He came in at his usual time, and I immediately started making him something new that I had in my head all day. Sweet cream ice cream with Oreos and little heart-shaped candies that I brought from home just for this. As always, he left me his note on the receipt with a tip, but it was special this time. It said, it's my turn to make you something. Meet me at Jasmine's Fine Kitchen tomorrow at 9pm. The restaurant he was referring to was in the same parking lot where I work. I went home and spent about two hours trying to figure out what I was going to wear for my date. I showed up the next night to the restaurant, ready to finally talk to this guy. I walked in and I saw him waiting for me at a really nice table in the back of the room. The first thing he said to me was, what can I get you tonight, miss? With a huge smile on his face. It turns out he works as a cook at the restaurant. I of course told him to surprise me, just like he would always request from me. He went at the back and immediately came out with a three-course meal that he had already prepared for us. We had the most amazing date and the rest is history. He still comes in every Friday to get his surprise ice cream order for me. Story time on when my mom kicked me out of the house and told me not to come back. So my mom was a security guard and she worked nightly shifts. And I'm not gonna lie, once I hit high school, I used to sneak boys in and out of the house. Now at the time I was dating a boy, he was 18 and I was 15. Let's just call him Vomit. So one night Vomit came over. And of course at the time my mom was working. So you already know we was doing grown things. You already know we was doing grown stuff. So then I hear the front door open. She starts calling my name from the bottom of the stairs. And you already know I ran over there because I got nervous. So I hurry up, I put on all my clothes, and I tell him to hide in my closet. So I go downstairs and I ask my mom, I'm shocked that she's home so early. Like, why is she home so early? And she said that she had an early shift that night because her job closed early or something like that. So then I hear him walking upstairs and me and my mom look at each other. I ran up those stairs so quick. And then my mom said, you have five seconds to come downstairs right now before I beat your ass. Like for part two. Part two, when my mom kicked me out of the house and told me not to come back. So then I came downstairs and she told me she better not see no guy upstairs inside of her house or I'm getting kicked out. And so, of course, I told her, I was like, um, listen, I'm really sorry. Don't kick me out. It's just, he's my friend. He's my friend. So then Vomit walks downstairs and he still has no pants on. And my mom just looks at me in shock. She's like, how old are you? He's like, I'm 18. Why? And I'm just sitting there like, this boy cannot be any more slow. Like, you notice it's my mother. She said, get the hell out my house. She smacked me hard as hell across my face and told me to get all of my stuff and get out her house because she quote unquote didn't raise no hoe. So I got all my stuff. I left. I went to my friend's house and I never seen her ever since. I am now currently living at one of my family members house, but they told me that I have to get a job and help pay the bills. So that's what I'm doing now. Story time of how I found out that my mom was putting our dad's ashes in our food. Yep, our mom would put our dead dad's ashes in our dinner. So basically, after my dad died, my mom showed zero emotion. It's like she really didn't care at all. Like she kind of wanted it to happen. His death was like an unsolved case, and nobody knows how he actually died. 
And now that I get to think about it, it might have been my mom, but I don't want to jump to conclusions. And if it was her and she sees this video, I don't want to end up like him. Anyways, back to the story. So about a month after he died, she would always post a picture of me and my brother's dinner with the caption, you'll always be with them. Literally every single night. And honestly, nobody really caught on. All the comments were like, we're praying, we're praying, this and that. Until one day I was just sitting on the couch and I look over and my mom was pouring something into the mashed potatoes. So I go a little closer and I see her pouring the ashes of my dad into our mashed potatoes. Listen, this story only gets 10 times worse, so like for a part two. Part two of how my mom was putting my dad's ashes in me and my brother's dinner. Continuing on with the story, after I see her literally pouring my dad's ashes into our mashed potatoes, and I mean, this lady literally sees me staring at her pouring the ashes into our mashed potatoes, and she, like, doesn't even say anything. I was just, uh, you know, a little shocked. So after that, I just kept quiet until after dinner, and I was mad at my brother that night, so I just let him eat the ash mashed potatoes. So after dinner, I went up to my mom and asked her why she was putting our dad's ashes in our food. And her exact words were, your father was a bad man. He wasn't meant to be here. I said, what does that have to do with you putting his ashes in our dinner? She goes, it will just cleanse your soul. The witches told me to feed my children's father to them. Bishwe? I ended up telling my brother, but then me and him decided not to ever say anything ever again because we don't want her little spirits telling them to do the same thing with us, so... This is why you should never spend the night on Niku Mororo Island. In 1937, while on her flight around the world, Amelia Earhart mysteriously vanished over Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean. Despite an enormous search, she was never found. Three years after her disappearance, a scientist discovered an incomplete skeleton on this tiny, uninhabited island called Niku Mororo Island that wasn't too far from Howland Island. It looked like whoever's bones these were, they had been ripped limb from limb. But when the bones were examined, they determined they were not Amelia Earhart's. But in 2017, a forensic anthropologist re-examined the bones and determined they were almost definitely Amelia's. So scientists went to Niku Mororo Island and they found freckle cream, something Amelia was famous for using. So the working theory is she crash landed on Niku Mororo Island and she fell asleep somewhere on the beach. Then, after smelling her blood, hundreds of three foot wide coconut crabs came out of their burrows, swarmed her, and ate her. Story time about my horrible toxic ex. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. My ex and I had been friends for three months. When he asked me out, I said yes because I really liked him. But the relationship only lasted one month. He started showing red flags really quick. He would constantly try to monopolize my time. If I told him that I couldn't hang out, he would show up to my house randomly without even asking if he could come over. It's like he was checking to see if I was telling the truth or not. Anytime I would be babysitting, he would also show up and ask to hang out. Obviously, I would say no because I was working. He also monitored all of my social media. If I posted anything about BLM, he would get so angry and he wouldn't talk to me. One day, I get a text from him saying, I don't think this is going to work out anymore. He actually broke up with me over text. I was on a road trip with my family at the time, so I was so distracted and I I thought I'd be okay. A few days later, I find out he started dating my best friend. Then he started sending me abusive text messages. Part two is up. My ex started sending me abusive text messages, calling me an SLUT and saying that I was stupid. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. I tried to reason with him, but he just wouldn't listen. Of course, I ended up blocking him. A few days later, he showed up at my house. I asked him why he was there. He said he was just riding his bike around. I didn't buy it for one second. He made it a habit of just showing up to my house on his bike. Then he started texting me from another number. He was constantly trying to get my attention. Of course, I blocked that number as well. I get a message from my best friend who had started dating my ex when we broke up. She asked me if we could hang out and I said yes. We talked for a few hours and we made up. She explained to me how verbally abusive he was with her too and that he was stalking her as well. But guess what? It gets worse. On top of all of that, he called my sister and started telling her that I was too fat for him, that I was unattractive and that I didn't bring enough energy into the relationship and that that's why he broke up with me. That's when I called him and we got into a huge fight. Part three is a... Uh, my ex called my sister and told her that I was too fat for him and that I was unattractive and that's why he had to break up with me. That's when we got into a huge fight over the phone. Of course, we both said extremely hurtful things. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. That guy said he had been stalking me and sending me abusive text messages. I kept blocking him and he would keep coming back. Then again, he would show up at my house. His excuse was that he was riding his bike around my neighborhood. 
I told him I needed space. A few days later, I'm hanging out with my friends, and there he is. Shows up totally uninvited. Everyone knew what had happened, but he still tried to talk to me. Of course, I ignored him. A few hours later, I get a ton of notifications from Instagram. Guess what? It's my ex. He started begging for forgiveness. He was trying to justify every single thing he did. There was no excuse for his abusive behavior. Not to me or my best friend. I told him to leave me alone, but he still kept sending the messages. They're starting to get to me. I know I shouldn't want to be with him, but part of me still loves him. He's the first person I've ever fallen in love with. I don't know what to do. Today at work, I was trying to call my wife, but for some reason, my phone calls weren't getting through to her. So I used one of my coworkers' phones to dial my house number and call home. So I call home and a sweet voice answers the phone. It's my daughter. I go, hey, cutie, how you doing? She goes, hey, daddy, what's up? And I go, I'm just at work. Uh, what are you and mommy doing? She says, uh, well, I just finished lunch and mommy's upstairs. I go, cutie, what's mommy doing upstairs? She goes, she's with Uncle Paul. And I go, Uncle Paul? We don't have an Uncle Paul. What do you mean? She's like, yeah, she's with Uncle Paul. They're upstairs in their room. So I'm like, cutie, that doesn't sound right. So what I want you to do is I want you to leave the phone on the kitchen table, go upstairs to your mommy's room and say, hey, daddy just pulled in the driveway and tell me what happens, all right? She did it and like a minute later, she comes back and picks up the phone and goes, okay, daddy, I did it. And I go, okay, what, what happened? She goes, well, mommy came running out of her room naked and she tripped down the stairs and bumped her head and now she can't get up. So I was like, what about the other guy? And she goes, well, Uncle Paul tried to jump out of the window into the pool, but he missed and hit the floor. Now he won't wake up. So I was like, we don't have a pool. Then I look at the phone number and I was like, oh, sorry, wrong number. Story time about the scariest night of my life. A lot of background information. So the one weekend, my sister and I decided that we were going to go to my stepdad's. And her best friend was going to come also. I was around 13 at the time. Well, my stepdad and my mom had been broken up for about a few months. But my dad was okay with us going to our stepdad's because he had been with our mom for around seven years and he's always been good to us. And my stepdad's was two hours away. So fast forward, we get to his house and my sister and her friend wanted to go to a party. Now, me being older now, I knew that they didn't want to bring me because they were around 16 and I was only 13. But I still tried to tag along. Well, they weren't really talking to me or anything. And I hadn't seen my mom in almost a year. So I told my stepdad that I wanted wanted to go and see her which was a super big deal because she absolutely hated my stepdad and she didn't want him around us oh, and by the way she lived like five minutes from him so if she found out that we went all the way up there to see him and not her she would have flipped so he drives me to my mom's house like for part two part two about the worst night of my life so before I got to my mom's house, I called her and I pretty much just told her that I was with my stepdad and I wanted to come see her. Like I said, she lived five minutes away. So as soon as we pull up, she walks outside and she starts screaming at my stepdad. She's like, those are my kids. You're not allowed to see them, blah, blah, blah. Even though my dad had full custody and he could decide who we could and couldn't see. So after that, we walk in the house. She isn't saying anything. And this house is pretty much like a trap house. There was a knife holding the door shut, not a kitchen knife, like an actual knife that you stab people with she's like you can sit down make yourself comfortable and i didn't want to sit down because i saw needles everywhere and i just saw a rat crawl under the couch so i was like no i'm fine and then she was like sorry not everybody can be rich like you which just to make clear i'm not rich i just knew that she was doing drugs with her boyfriend in that house after that she pulls the knife that was holding the door shut out and points it right at me like for part three Part three about the worst night of my life. So before she points the knife at me, she had been in the kitchen, right? So I went to go and sneak out the door. That's whenever she ran over, ripped the knife out of the door and pointed it right at me. And she's like screaming a bunch of shit at me. And she's like, oh, what are you going to tell your dad that I pointed a knife at you? And I told her, yeah, like, what the fuck do you mean? Am I not going to tell him? So at this point, she tries to take my phone. And I told her, no, you're not taking my phone. And at this time, my sister's also texting me and yelling at me because she had told me that I should not go to my mom's house. Probably for that exact reason. A few minutes later, she hears her boyfriend pull up. I had never met her boyfriend. Like I said, I haven't seen her in probably almost a year. As soon as she hears him pull up, she looks at me and she says, go out the back door. She literally hurries up, takes me to the back door and I have to run out the back door. I don't even know where I am. My sister and stepdad were waiting at the gas station across the street. So I ran over there really quickly. And then a few things happened after that. Let me know if you guys want a part four. Part four about the worst night of my life. Just a little side note, I am in bed, so it's going to be a black screen and you can probably hear my dog snoring.
And I'm just going to go from my point of view the rest of the time because I texted my sister, but I think she's sleeping. So pretty much I had to call my sister after my mom told her to go out the back door. And there was a sheet right across from where she was. But since she had to go out the back, she just saw like all woods and no gas station. So I got on the phone with her. She runs over to the gas station. And when we get back to my stepdad's house, we call our dad and let him know what happened. And the police actually got involved and they had called my dad because my mom had called them and told him a bunch of stuff that just wasn't true. Like saying that my stepdad was a pedophile and stuff, just like saying stuff that could actually ruin this man's life. And usually my stepdad would come pick us up and then drop us back off. But the police said that my dad had to come get us tomorrow morning, even though he had full custody and could decide who he could go with and stuff. So my dad came the next day and picked us up.